Welcome to part two of our voiceover lecture for chapter three on the cells and tissues. Previously, we discussed cell theory, plasma membrane, cell parts, and the extracellular stuff outside the cells. In part two, we're going to discuss cell transport, cell division, protein synthesis, and the tissues. Section five, cell transport. In this section, we'll talk about the transport of materials in and out of a cell. There are two major types of transport, passive transport and active transport. In passive transport, we'll discuss diffusion, osmosis, simple diffusion, and facilitated diffusion, followed by the discussion of active transport. Passive transport is the transport of materials without using energy. The first type of passive transport we'll discuss is diffusion. The simplest form of passive transport is diffusion. Diffusion is defined as the net movement of molecules from a high concentration to an area of low concentration. In this diagram, you can see the molecules in red are floating in water. On the left, they're in an area of high concentration, and over time, the molecules spread out and get further away from each other. In other words, they move to an area of low concentration. This diagram shows an example of diffusion. Purple dye is dropped in a beaker of water. The dye starts out concentrated in one area. The molecules of dye move away from each other and eventually distribute evenly throughout the water. Why do molecules diffuse? Diffusion is explained by the random motion of molecules in a fluid. Imagine you have a jar filled with two colors of marbles. The marbles represent molecules. The bottom of the jar contains red, red marbles, and above them are blue marbles. You shake the jar to represent their random motion. The red and blue marbles start off concentrated to their respective areas, but as they move randomly about as you shake the jar, they will spread throughout the jar, even to areas where they initially had a low concentration. That is diffusion. Now let's discuss a second form of passive transport, osmosis. To understand osmosis, we must define a few terms. A solvent is a substance that dissolves other substances. A solute is a substance that's dissolved by the solvent. To truly be a solute, it must remain suspended in the solvent. And finally, a solution is the mixture of the two. It's a solvent plus a solute. For example, a solvent might be water. The solute that you would dissolve in that water might be sugar, and the solution would be the sugar water, the mixture of the sugar and the water together. Osmosis is defined as the net movement of water across the membrane toward an area that has a higher concentration of solutes. Note that for in order to have osmosis, you must have a membrane and there must be two different concentrations on either side of that membrane. You can think of osmosis like this. Water is going to move towards the area where it can dilute those solutes, make them more watery. Now let's discuss the concept of tonicity. Tonicity describes the concentration of a solution outside of living tissue or cells. For example, an isotonic solution is one in which the concentration of solutes is the same both inside the cells and outside the cells. Animals prefer to be in isotonic solutions. The pictures below, the picture on the left, shows red blood cells in an isotonic solution. You can see they have their normal, healthy shape. In a hypertonic solution, there's a higher concentration of solutes outside the cell. Because of osmosis, water will be drawn out of the cells. The cells shrink and shrivel. We call this crenation. And finally, in a hypotonic solution, there's a higher concentration of solutes inside the cell than outside. This causes water to move into the cell and cells start to inflate and eventually break. We call that lysis. The third type of passive transport is simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is the unassisted diffusion of molecules across the membrane. 
Do you remember what the plasma membrane of a cell is composed of? That's right, a phospholipid bilayer. And for molecules to move across the phospholipid bilayer, they must be small in order to slip between the phospholipid molecules. They also must be lipid soluble, in other words, hydrophobic. This is because the middle of the phospholipid bilayer is composed of fatty acid tails and only hydrophobic molecules may come in contact with them. There are a few molecules that can cross by simple diffusion, including oxygen, CO2, and nitric oxide gases. Note that the term for this type of transport is simple diffusion. You should not confuse this with the term diffusion, where no membrane is involved. The final type of passive transport is facilitated diffusion. Most molecules are too large or too polar to move directly through the phospholipid bilayer. Instead, these molecules move through protein channels. A protein channel is a protein that lets molecules move through the membrane. The molecules are still moving due to diffusion from high to low concentration, but they travel through proteins without coming in contact with the fatty acid tails. You can see in the diagram the green hexagons representing monosaccharides are traveling through a protein that acts like a channel. The monosaccharides are moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. Here is a specific example of a protein channel that allows for facilitated diffusion, that is, the aquaporins. Aquaporins allow water molecules to travel across their membranes. It's aquaporins that allow for osmosis to occur. In previous forms of cell transport, molecules moved from high concentration to low concentration. But if we want molecules to move in the opposite direction, remember there are two major types of transport, passive transport, which we just discussed, and active transport. In active transport, energy is used in the form of ATP. Active transport, like the cartoon below, involves the use of pumps. There are three examples of active transport, the sodium potassium pump, the proton pump, and co-transport. But we'll focus on the sodium potassium pump for the purposes of this up and coming test. A good analogy for the two types of transport is moving along a river on a boat. You can simply sit in the boat and let the current pull you along. That's like passive transport. Or you can paddle against the current upstream requiring much more effort. Active transport is like paddling upstream. In active transport, we say the molecules are traveling up the concentration gradient, in other words, against the flow of diffusion. Active transport requires the expenditure of energy in the form of ATP. In the diagram below, you can see molecules represented by the green squares are moving against diffusion through a protein pump. You can also see ATP is being used. The type of active transport that you need to know is the sodium potassium pump. In the diagram below is a cell at rest. A resting cell must maintain a high concentration of sodium ions outside the cell and a high concentration of potassium ions inside the cell. Note that biologists call the outside of the cell the extracellular space. The sodium potassium pump is responsible for maintaining a cell at these conditions. It pumps any potassium that escapes back into the cell and at the same time pumps sodium ions that leak in back out. You should also know that the inside of the cell has an overall negative charge while the extracellular space is positive. The sodium potassium pump is a protein pump in that it's made out of protein. It pumps three sodiums into the cell for every two potassium ions that it pumps out. The sodium potassium pump sort of works like a Pac-Man where it's open on the inside allowing three sodium ions to bind. It'll also bind to ATP causing a change in the protein so that the protein is now open towards the outside of the cell. It'll release the three sodium ions and allow two potassium ions to bind. Once those potassium ions have bound, the protein will change shape again 
so that it opens back to the inside of the cell and release those two potassium ions to the inside. Here is a video describing and showing how the sodium potassium pump works. You should go to YouTube to watch this video. The sodium potassium pump is responsible for maintaining an electrochemical gradient. The electrochemical gradient is composed of two forces, an electrical gradient and a chemical gradient. The electrical gradient, like a voltage, is a separation of charges. As discussed, the inside of the cell is negatively charged while the outside is positive. This is also known as an electrical potential difference. The other force, a chemical gradient, is simply the difference in the concentration of sodium and potassium ions. It is also possible in some instances for these two forces, forces to oppose each other. Section 6, Cell Division. Please take a moment to review the human life cycle from Chapter 1, if you feel you need to. In that chapter, I mentioned that humans produce two different gametes, the sperm and egg. The sperm and egg fuse during fertilization. Normally, human cells contain 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. We have a pair of chromosome number 1s, one you received from your father and one from your mother. We have a pair of chromosome 2s, also one from your mother and one from your father. The same goes for chromosome 3, 4, 5, and 6, and so on. Before our gametes fuse, we must reduce the number of chromosomes by half because one extra chromosome is usually fatal. The gametes are made in a process called meiosis where the number of chromosomes is cut in half during cell division. Now when the gametes fuse, the correct number of chromosomes is maintained. After fertilization, the resulting cell, called the zygote, undergoes numerous cell divisions. During these cell divisions, the number of chromosomes must be maintained. This type of cell division is called mitosis. The picture on this slide is called a karyotype, where all of the chromosomes from an individual cells are laid out. To summarize, meiosis is cell division where the number of chromosomes is cut in half, and mitosis is a cell division where the number of chromosomes is maintained. Like our bodies, our cells undergo a process of growth and development. This is called the cell cycle. The cell cycle is divided into two major phases, interphase and M phase. Interphase has three subphases and begins with the G1 phase. In the G1 phase, the cell has just come out of cell division and needs to grow, hence G for growth. In S phase, the cell is already preparing to divide. The DNA of the cell is duplicated in anticipation of this. In G2, the cell grows and duplicates many of its organelles these organelles will be divvied up into the two daughter cells. The next major phase of the cell cycle is M phase. M phase has two subphases, mitosis and cytokinesis. These will be discussed in subsequent slides. The German biologist, Walter Fleming, was the first to discover the chromosome. He discovered chromosomes by inventing a special dye. In fact, the term chromosome means colored body because that's all we knew about chromosomes at that time. Chromosomes are DNA molecules that are tightly packaged during cell division. We have 23 pairs or 46 total chromosomes per cell. A homologous pair are the maternal and paternal pair of chromosomes of the same length with the same types of genes. For example, both our chromosome number ones are a homologous pair. This diagram represents a pair of homologous chromosomes before and after S phase or replication. Before S phase, you can see the homologous chromosomes exist as a single strand each. After replication, the chromosomes have duplicated and now exist as a pair of sister chromatids. They remain connected to each other at a constricted central region known as the centromere. 
The centromeres can be seen here on the blue chromosome and here on the red chromosome. This is an electron micrograph of real chromosomes. The maternal chromosomes are colored red and paternal chromosomes are colored blue. In this picture, you can clearly see the centromeres of some of these chromosomes. Again, this is the constricted region at the center of the chromosome where sister chromatids or exact duplicates remain fixed to each other. Another cellular structure important for cell division is the centrosome. Remember, centrosomes control the growth and shrinking of our microtubules. Before cell division, there is only one centrosome. The centrosome divides during cell division and reorganizes the microtubules into the mitotic spindle. At this point, the microtubules are known as spindle fibers. In this picture, the microtubules are stained with a fluorescent green dye. You can see that they radiate out from two points. This suggests the cell is dividing and there are two centrosomes. Mitosis is divided up into four phases, which I remember with the word PMAT. The first phase of mitosis is prophase. In fact, pro means first or most important. The second phase is metaphase, followed by anaphase, and then telophase. There are several things that occur during prophase that you need to know. During prophase, the chromosomes condense. That means they go from being loose strands of DNA to being wound up and tightly bound into chromosomes. Also during prophase, the nuclear envelope breaks down. Centrosomes divide and the mitotic spindle, which is composed of microtubules, begins to form. During metaphase, the centrosomes have migrated to opposite sides of the cell. Remember, centrosomes are controlling the microtubules or spindle fibers at this point. The centrosomes tell the spindle fibers to attach to the centromeres of each chromosome. The centrosomes are pulling on the spindle fibers and thus pulling on the chromosomes in a game of tug of war until the chromosomes align down the center of the cell. Anaphase, which is the shortest phase of mitosis, is where the chromosomes which have aligned on the center of the cell are now separated into each individual sister chromatid. One half or one sister chromatid from each homologous pair will go to one side of the cell and the other half to the other side of the cell. This is an electron micrograph of chromosomes in late anaphase. You can see that the chromosomes which are stained dark are at opposite sides of the cell. Telophase is the last phase of mitosis. In telophase, the sister chromatids are at opposite ends of the dividing cell. A nuclear envelope forms around the sister chromatids, creating two new nuclei. Within the new nuclei, chromosomes decondense or loosen. At this point, mitosis is complete. Here's a depiction of the stages of mitosis. Here you can see a cell in prophase. The centrosomes have divided, the microtubules have rearranged into the mitotic spindle, and within the nucleus you can see the DNA has condensed into the individual chromosomes. Eventually this nuclear envelope that surrounds the chromosomes will break down. Let's skip prometaphase and go on to metaphase. In metaphase, the mitotic spindle is pulling and tugging on the chromosomes until they align down the center of the cell. In anaphase, the sister chromatids, which form the X structure of the chromosomes, have now separated in half and are now traveling to opposite sides of the cell. The final stage of mitosis, telophase, the sister chromatids are at opposite ends, the mitotic spindle will deform, and a nucleus will form around the sister chromatids at each end. This GIF depicts mitosis occurring in the cell at an accelerated rate. Remember, M phase is not just mitosis, it's also cytokinesis. In cytokinesis, 
the cell is divided into two daughter cells. So this is when the cell actually splits in half. True cytokinesis only occurs in animal cells. The process is a bit different in plants, bacteria, and fungus. Remember that in mitosis, the microtubules act as the mitotic spindle. Similarly, in cytokinesis, actin, another form of cytoskeleton, helps divide the cell in the form of the contractile ring. In this picture, the ring that's colored red, here splitting the two cells in half, is the contractile ring. On the outside of the cell, we have a structure called the cleavage furrow. To cleave means to cut in half. So the cleavage furrow is what the cell looks like as it's being divided during cytokinesis. For mitosis to occur properly, the DNA must be replicated. An exact copy of all our cell's DNA is made. This occurs during S phase of interphase. For DNA to be duplicated, it must first be unzipped. In other words, the two strands of the double helix are pulled apart one base pair at a time. As individual bases exposed on an old strand of DNA, a new strand is made directly on that old strand. The new strand must follow the base pairing rules. A's always pair with T's and G's always pair with C's. That concludes part two of the voiceover lecture for chapter three. Stay tuned for part three of chapter three.